Today's episode is brought to you by the Reese Hotel in Queenstown. Now is the time to book your five-star hotel stay at the Reese Hotel in Queenstown, proudly New Zealand owned and operated. With stunning lake and mountain views, courtesy town shuttles, a private beach and jetty access, and staff that'll blow your socks off with their impeccable service, it's definitely not your average weekend getaway. Guests can experience the talents of Chef Corey Hume at True South Dining Room for some exquisite locally sourced produce or their lobby bar with the award-winning wine cellar bursting with local and international vintages or simply work your way through their cocktail list. Perhaps if the mood strikes, uh, break out the in-house Bentley Continental for a quick lakeside spin or an airport pickup with a difference. The video you're seeing now, I took over the weekend with my stay up there. This is the view from one of their balconies. While all the rooms come with balconies and heaps of space to enjoy these views, now is the time to book your weekend getaway with a special discounted price. Book now via the hotel website. That's the race, T H E R E E S dot co dot NZ. Use the promo code COVID 19, one word to receive a special offer of 10% off any accommodation. That's thereese.co.nz and use the promo code COVID-19 for your getaway. The Behemoth Brewing Company presents the Department of Conversation with Pat Brittenden. Behemoth, give me something hoppy. Hey, so thank you for joining us. Um, you, you are, I, I was watching some videos of you yesterday, actually. You are, you are visited to New Zealand before. I, I think I saw you in Christchurch at the Skeptics, uh, the Skeptics Conference, something like that. Yeah, I, I've been there twice. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, both for Skeptics Conferences, about four years apart. That's something that is is part of your life, the skeptics world. Is that basically, I mean, when I look, uh, like we've got a skeptics group here in Dunedin in New Zealand, uh, which meet at a pub every week and they, they talk about things. And I'm assuming that's things like, uh, you know, um, debunking religion or flat earth. Or is that is that what we think about when we hear about official skeptics groups? Uh, so, I mean, it's kind of evolved a little bit over the last 20, 30 years since we've been doing this. You know, originally, um, the skeptical movement, scientific skepticism was about uh, promoting science and debunking pseudoscience, right? And, you know, promoting scientific literacy. And that's what we thought was like, that's what we needed to do in order to you know, reduce the amount of pseudoscience in the world. Uh, but then, you know, over the last 20, 30 years, partly because of experience, partly because of just the movement maturing, partly because of research done by psychologists and you know, people who study this sort of thing. You know, it became pretty obvious that um, scientific literacy by itself doesn't really accomplish much. And you need to combine it with critical thinking skills. What's critical thinking skills? It's kind of a broad umbrella, but it's knowledge of logic, philosophy, uh, neuroscience, you know, how our brains work, how we deceive ourselves. Uh, what I call neuropsychological humility, the ability to understand the weaknesses in our own ability to perceive and process information and the limits of our own thinking and logic, uh, cognitive biases, that sort of thing. And then the third piece uh, is that we realize that, yeah, this also, although again, you might file this under critical thinking, but it is, a, it is worthy of um, its own category. And that is media savvy, right? Media literacy. You need to understand how to consume the media, how to tell a reliable source from an unreliable source, uh, the kinds of processes that that occur within journalism or, or, the, or different kinds of media that might bias the narrative in one direction or another. And you put these three things together, maybe who knows, in 10 years, there'll be something, we'll add something else to the list. But the, these, I think, you know, capture everything that we do, promoting scientific literacy, promoting critical thinking skills, promoting media literacy as a sort of a combined skill set so that we can tell what's more likely to be true versus less likely to be true. You know, there's there's no absolute certitude out there, but, you know, we just want to know, you know, we want to have a reasonable, uh, realistic assessment of how likely something is to be true. Uh, people don't 
necessarily do that, or they believe a lot of things which are almost certainly wrong, while they might not believe things which are almost certainly true. So clearly they're following a flawed method, and, and we're just yeah. trying to figure out what that is and, and correct it. And look, uh, the, what you just explained couldn't be uh, more relevant and needed in our world today. As I speak to you, literally as I speak to you, so this will, the people who are watching this uh, the next day will know when we've done this. Uh, we have a protest. This is Lisa's a live feed of uh, stuff.co.nz, which is where my uh, podcast is platform, of uh, protests going on in our capital right now around, well, they say it's around... Um, they say it's around mandates, but as you can see here, the big sign in the middle of the, the big sign in the middle of the thing is talking about the vaccine. So mm -hmm. it's really an anti, in my opinion, an anti-vaxxer march, uh, kind of uh, hidden in amongst civil liberties. That's because mm -hmm. when you look at the crew, every single one of them is unmasked. It's just a mass spreader event. So, um, yeah, I, I think what you're talking about. I spoke to a, a at the, kind of the start of the whole pandemic. I spoke to. An academic out of the UK, uh, Dr. Stephen Lewandowski, who talked about mm -hmm. um, the research he had through when people don't believe climate change and how it relates to what we were going through then. And the idea of, I guess, scientific literacy and understanding what to believe and what to trust and why seems just so more relevant today than ever before, perhaps. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I think it's always been relevant. I think every generation thinks that theirs is the one that's having the big crisis. But it, I mean, I think we could say things have ha have gotten objectively more challenging with mm. social media, with the mass media. There are, um, you know, I think we're, we're, we're also probably coming out of, like if you go back to the 70s into the 80s, what some people have called like a golden age of journalism. And so it may seem that way only because we're, maybe we're regressing to the mean, you know, but it's, I think to some extent, it's always this way. There's always pseudoscience. Yeah. There's always fraud. There's always cranks. There's always ideology, you know, tribalism, sectarian views, et cetera. And, and, you know, uh, it, this is not anything that's ever going to stop as far as we can tell. It's just part of the human condition. And so that's why, again, like they think the most important thing is just to give people a skill set that they could use to, to navigate an increasingly complicated world with increasingly complicated narratives and claims. Um, you know, part of that is increasing scientific knowledge, you know, uh, the world's just a lot more complicated than it used to be. And it's just harder, harder and harder to navigate all of that. Well, listen, I want to have a talk specifically about something you wrote this week. Um, I want to thank one of our um, listeners and viewers, Joe, who brought to my attention your article. I knew already about you, but the article you wrote. But before we actually get into that, um, you're someone who has, and I'm, I'm not sure whether, I'm sure it won't embarrass you, but this is something that you particularly care about, but your CV is very impressive. So I want people who are um, joining us today to know who you are and what you do. So I'm going to read out my introduction to you which a professional podcaster would have done at the start. Um, and then let's get into the conversation you're having. Cause I, I'm going to, I'm going to stuff up this quote, but I remember someone talking about science as the best worst answer we have right now. And science is something that we achieved to get a better answer. It still may not be the best yet, but it's the best one we have in moving forward. So I want to get into that conversation with you. So you are an academic neurologist at Yale university school of medicine. You are the president and co-founder of the new England, uh, new England skeptical society. You are the founder and senior editor at the blog Science Based Medicine, which is a blog dedicated to promoting the highest standard of science and medical practice. You are the host of the Skeptics Guide to the Universe. Uh, it's a podcast and author of the book by the same name. And you're a man who I appreciate more than anything because after doing some work getting ready for this podcast, I now know how to spell algorithms. <laughs> As a dyslexic and an auditory learner, I it's one of those it's one of those words. You know, I'm I'm sure you don't, but many of us have those one or two words. Ironically, one of mine is dyslexic as well. But, um, but algorithm, I now know how to spell after looking at your uh, looking at your latest article and writing it down twenty or thirty times to get ready for this podcast. So, I want to thank you for that as well. Sure, I have some of those words too. There are some words I will never spell correctly on the first go. <laughs> Just not. I'm still, trying, I'm still trying to get together with yacht, <laughs> yak, or something, and I still spell guitar. Gu in my head, I say guitar when I'm trying to spell mm -hmm. guitar. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so Joe, one of our um, regular contributors, listeners, um, people who, who hook on to our conversation, thank you again to him, sent me your article. I get sent articles often from people and it's 
fantastic. On another blog that you actually uh, host and run called Neurologica Blog, I like the tagline to Neurologica Blog because it says, your daily fix of neuroscience, skepticism, and critical thinking. I just think all of us need a daily fix of uh, <laughs> neuroscience. It's something we need to have. And it's titled as people can see who are watching or if you're listening, you can go to Neurologica Blog uh, to, to see for yourself, Joe Rogan and the Media Algorithm. An unbelievably fascinating read as i said as a as a dyslexic who was an auditory learner i didn't want anything more than to talk to you about it as well because that's going to help me even understand it more hopefully but what i wanted to ask you first is that as i said the heading is joe rogan and the media algorithm which algorithm or algorithms are you talking about in this because you identify in the article that the media has always followed algorithms. And you mentioned back in the day, uh, we were talking about sensationalism was the algorithm. But now we also have algorithms designed in the back ends of Facebook to, to mm -hmm. give us information as well automatically. So primarily in this, as a neuroscientist, what algorithms are you addressing in this article? Yeah, so I'm just using that as sort of a metaphor for a series of, of steps or editorial decisions in this case that uh, the media makes in deciding what to report and how to report it. There's always an editorial decision being made, right? You don't report everything just, you know, you, you don't just list facts, right? Journalists tell a story. You know, the successful communication in any medium is always about telling stories. And so journalists have to figure out what the story is and which stories to tell, because there's so much stuff happening out there. You could choose, you know, what to tell. Uh, and those two decisions have a tremendous influence on, you know, what we just generally call your editorial policy, right? Or the editorial slant. We know that like some newspapers, you know, going back, you know, traditional media, slant, you know, conservative or liberal or, you know, whatever, however that parses out in different countries uh, or, or some try to be more, you know, more moderate or more extreme, et cetera. Uh, but, but one, I, I started with sensationalism because I think that is the, the approach that most people understand. This is sort of really old school. This has been going on forever and everybody understands what we mean by that, where yeah. the, this is the if it bleeds, it leads, right, is the sure. approach where let's take the most extreme, emotionally impactful story, and that's the news. That's what we report. The thing that's going to have the most uh, you know, incredible story, the most emotional appeal. And then it also involves telling any story in, a, in an emotional way, you know. So um, one of the things, like as a science communicator, we talk a lot about how science is reported in the mainstream media. And, and the sensationalism approach turns every tiny incremental scientific advance into a breakthrough, you know? It's always scientists are stunned at this amazing breakthrough. The, the, this, the meat of the story may be legitimate, may even be accurate, but it's all framed in the most sensational way possible. In fact, the next blog post I wrote after that one about Joe Rogan was about that very thing, the recent news story about a, what I consider to be an incremental but nice little advance in the technology of trying to use electrical stimulation to, to um, get people who have spinal cord injury to help them walk, help them move. Uh, but th that was reported as a breakthrough the first time ever. Man with spinal cord injury walks for the first time as if it was this huge deal. But it was, you know what? They tweaked the electrodes so they work a little better. You know, that was right. the actual story. It was good. But Science today especially advances by these a million baby steps, it's just not media friendly. Oh, one more baby step, you know, 20 more, 30, 40 more, and we'll be somewhere, you know. How do you report on that? Um, so they turn everything into the missing link we discovered. They say, well, cur cure the common cold or cure cancer. So they fall into these tropes, these sensationalism tropes. Um, but, you know, pre that's still around. We still need to understand that. But everyone... I think under, has a feel for what sensationalism is, but there are more recent, I think, I mean, I think these all again come and go over time, but uh, have, it, there have been trends over the last 30, 40, 50 years uh, towards other, I think more subtle algorithms in terms of like how the media chooses what to report and how to report it. Um, and so I was talking about what Joe Rogan is doing because in a recent, you know, there's a recent controversy about, um, 
you know, one of the, he has, you know, he has many controversial things that he does, but, but about having guests on his show spouting dangerous health misinformation in the middle of a pandemic. You know, some people think that that's not a good idea. <laughs> and in, 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 in a sort of a not apology kind of justification video, Rogan explicitly tells the world what his editorial algorithm is. He said it. You don't have, there's no, you don't have to infer it. We don't have to guess. He said really just a couple of things, right? He boiled it down to, first of all, he said, I'm not an expert. I don't know anything. So nothing that I say should be taken with any authority, right? So that's one part of his algorithm or his editorial policy is that he holds himself to absolutely no standard. He doesn't think he needs to hold himself to a standard because he's just a regular guy who nobody should expect to know anything. Well, I right? think it's beyond even just the regular guy thing, because often that comment will come out in his podcast. And I am, or I have been in the past a listener. I'm less of a listener now since yeah. he's gone to Spotify, primarily because I don't find him. He doesn't pop up in my iTunes feed, you know. Mm. But he, he, he goes a bit beyond I'm just a regular guy to I'm just a comedian. So in other words, he can also then say not just a regular guy, but, you know, I'm making light of a situation because I'm a comedian. And he plays yeah, that kind of as well. Yeah, that is the Alex Jones defense, although not qu as explicit as Alex, Alex Jones was kind of forced to say in a lawsuit, hey, this is just a character I'm playing. I don't necessarily believe any of the things that I'm saying, right? It's a character. Rogan yeah. didn't quite go all full Alex Jones. He didn't go all the way there. But yeah. that's the implication. It's like, not only am I just a regular guy with no expertise, I'm a comedian. So at any time I want to, I could just say, well, I didn't really mean it. It was for humor. It was a joke. Yeah, yeah. You know, so it's kind of this sort of floating excuse for anything he might say. Um, you know, it's, it, it, and if the, if that were, it were literally true, like when we watch a comic doing a performance on stage, there is an understanding, an explicit understanding with the audience that, don't take a single thing this person says seriously. It is a 100% for the purpose of humor. Now, I know some some comedians will mix in social commentary and may, and b blur the lines. All lines are blurred. But, but you know, it's, that's, uh, that is a more, I think, realistic defense when you're a comic standing up on stage. Rogan's not doing comedy, right? And he doesn't say he's doing comedy. So that isn't really what he's saying. He's saying... Don't take anything I say as the word of authority. I'm just riffing here. You know, I don't even prepare half the time and I'm just riffing. So don't listen to me. And then his other half of his algorithm is I interview interesting people. And that's pretty much the sum total of his editorial filter that he said, at least as far as he says, he did, if he does anything else, he doesn't explicitly say it. He just mm -hmm. says, hey, I'm just a regular guy interviewing interesting people. So what, what I was writing about was let's explore that for a bit. And again, I wasn't offering any remedies. I wasn't saying anything about what we should do in response. And it's interesting how people take straight factual statements as if they you are saying all sorts of things you're not saying. You know, it'd be as if I said, you know, when you burn when you burn fossil fuels, you release carbon dioxide into the air. And then someone said, so you're saying we should immediately ban all fossil fuels, regardless of their economic you know, impact. It's like, no, that's not what I said. I just said burning fossil fuels releases carbon dioxide into the air. So what I was saying in my blog post was, you know, if as a media personality, a journalist, an interviewer, a TV host, a podcast host in this case, your only algorithm for determining who you platform is they're interesting Let's explore the implications of that for a bit. People who are interesting generally, mm -hmm. and this is the media, you know, this is what the, how the media finds interesting, are people who are saying things that are different from what everyone else is saying. Contradictory. They're, they're, they're contrarian yeah. or they're surprising or they're extreme, you know, maybe because they're fascinating. Uh, there could be legitimate reasons like, you know, a scientist who has some genuinely fascinating but scientifically accurate things to say. Or somebody who has a, a, a well thought out, valid opinion about something that may be a little bit outside of what what we typically think. Uh, whatever. There's all kinds of you know interesting guests that are that are I would consider to be you know legitimate um, uh, targets of this kind of format. 
But he's just like, no, they're just interesting. And we know from his show what that means, right? Um, so yeah, it could be any, if you're a crank who has something completely nonsensical to say, that's interesting. Mm. Um, uh, so what that leads to the interesting algorithm, right? Is you're going to be interviewing people who are most likely to be wrong and you are providing no filter because by your own admission, you don't have enough background knowledge to filter it or to put it into context or to fact check or whatever. So you are an unfiltered, what I said, fire hose of misinformation. That is what you are saying. You, Joe Rogan, that's what you're saying you're doing. That is, that's just a straightforward interpretation of what you, how you characterize your own editorial process. Um, and, and that's what we're seeing. It's also, I think, demonstrably what we're seeing from Joe Rogan. You know, he might, you know, he interviews, I think, people who are, who represent, you know, uh, valid scientific views as well. He's just kind of all mixed in there, which actually makes it worse. You know, people will use that and say, hey, he interviews a lot of people saying, you know, le scientific legitimate things as well, as if that balances it out somehow. But it actually makes it worse because then your average listener thinks it's all the same, right? It's yeah, this, yeah, yeah. You, it creates this equivalency yeah. where you have one scientist saying something which is not controversial and, and comports with the consensus of scientific evidence and, and interpretation. Someone else who's saying something outrageous but also has letters after their name is, all, is being treated just as as legitimate as the other person, it creates an equivalency there and it actually makes the damage worse. So when the, one of the big podcasts that he did that created a lot of controversy and you write about this was Dr. Malone. Now, um, I'm pretty sure that Dr. Malone is the man who claims to be the inventor of mRNA. We're talking about the same person there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in reality, what I hear you saying is having him on say followed by a Sanjay Gupta as a one-to-one, -one, it feels like 50, 50, but the reality is, to have a have a Dr. Malone on, there should have been perhaps ninety nine other um, scientists on after him, just you know disproving what he said to give it a fair proportional representation of the views that were held um, by the scientific community. I mean, that would be at least better, but but I don't think that would necessarily even be optimal uh, because it's it's as if saying, well, your food is 99% beef and it's only 1% horse manure. That's, that's okay <laughs> with you. Right. Um, it's like, well, I, I'll pass on the 1% yeah. horse manure burger. Um, but you know, the, uh, so saying that, well, you know, as long as you have mostly legitimate scientists on, you know, having an occasional pseudoscientist or somebody who's going to promote a view, which is almost certainly wrong is okay. Um, again, it's better than having even more pseudoscience on, but it's not optimal. Yeah, got um, it. yeah there, there's, there's, there's no reason to platform somebody who is saying things that are probably not true, especially if, you know, if you're not able to counter, you know, to hold them to the truth. Um, and or so you could do a couple of things, right? You could talk about Dr. Malone by an expert who knows the, the, the source material. So you tell okay. us about Dr. Malone's claims. And, you, and then if you want like to discuss the outrageous claims, you can do that with an expert who can put them into context, who understands the subtle scientific reasons where Dr. Malone departs from the mainstream views, you know, from, from uh, where, where the, what the evidence is leading to. Uh, or you could have a debate format where you have two people on and you, and you, at least then people will hear both sides. So you still may run into a false equivalency there, but at the, you know, if you have uh, someone who's able to hold, hold Dr. Malone, you know, to his statements and, you know, and, and ex ex explain to the audience why, well, that's not true. And here's why that's better than just giving him an open platform. Um, even then that you could run into serious problems if the format isn't good. And cause then you run into what we call the gish gallop, right? It's like creationists love going around debating evolutionists because in, in, in a, a, a so-called even format where both sides can just say whatever they want without any kind of format yeah. or filter or, uh, or, or debate, you know, rules, then you, you, the, the side spouting nonsense has a dramatic advantage because you can create, you know, a, uh, a mis, 
a misperception or a misconception in seconds that would take a scientist minutes to fix, to explain, well, that's wrong. Let me take 15 minutes to explain why that one thing you took three seconds to say is wrong. Meanwhile, yeah. you said 30 things that were wrong. I'm never going to get to all of them. And that's a that's an actual debating strategy that pseudoscientists use. They, we call it the Gish Gal because Dwayne Gish perfected that. He was a creationist, which made a career out of, you know, debating uh, evolutionary scientists. But if you have a, um, a uh, debate format where you can keep on one topic for a long enough time to go to the end of that topic, uh, more like a courtroom where there's rules of evidence and, there, you know, and, and you will be held account to what you said and you can't just go off on a tangent. Then the truth and, you know, scientists have a distinct advantage because they're correct, you know, in that format. But in any case, these are all things that somebody who is, has millions of listeners and is producing, you know, an, an interview formatted podcast should know. And if they don't know, they should learn. And, it, you know, people who have experience as science communicators, as journalists, as interviews, et cetera, are, you know, it's, it's perfectly reasonable for them to point out, you know, you're doing it wrong. This is what you should be doing. Yeah. Uh, and that's essentially, I think, what a lot of people are doing. They're like, you know, all right, this guy's got millions of listeners. You know, he he should be holding himself to a higher standard. This is how he could do that. This is why what he's doing is counterproductive and it's directly harmful in the middle of a pandemic. But even outside of that context, it's still spreading nonsense. And this is this is how and why that happens. Yeah, I like that you. I, I didn't think about this before because that that kind of when you say he's got a, a, such a large audience, Joe Rogan in particular, eleven million downloads. He's he said to have versus I think Tucker Carlson, who also in court said that they were he wasn't talking the truth on his own show. They had to admit to that. I think he's got the biggest uh, cable news show at about three million. So when you look at the numbers, and most CNN shows have less than a million. You yeah. look at the numbers, he's he's exponentially more he has, I don't say I don't know if powerful is the right word, but he has exponential more reach than that. Mm -hmm. But I like I like what you said, and I hadn't thought about this before. He is a comedian, but he's not in the stand-up comedian setting when he's having these conversations. And it just made me think straight away of Al Franken. You know, Al Franken, for people who don't know, was a, a comedian and a comedy writer, used to work on SNL and then became a, was it a senator or a congressman? Senator. Senator. And it would have been inappropriate for him to stand up in the Senate and be going, well, I'm just a comedian because it was a different setting for him to be in. So he was received a different way. And when you said that about when we go into a comedy club, we're sort of signing a, a contract that what you say on stage are stories, but that's not the setting that Joe Rogan's in when he's having his podcast with an expert opposite him. He's whether he likes it or not. Um, all of us, in fact, me with you today, we're setting ourselves up as a, a source of information um i'm i'm putting this podcast out there as a source for people to find information from you um uh, but it, it did also um it made me think about that saying that how lies goes around the world three times before truth gets its pants on that gash the gish gallop mm -hmm. you know that you've got to come back several times but i did it also think looking at all of these all of these things and looking at the the example of one to 99 that i gave that you kind of said that's still like one percent manure which sounds repulsive where is the position then for contrary positions, like contrary opinions? Um, I, I love you know, sort of doing something similar, just talking to interesting people. I've had probably two conversations in the last 250 podcasts with flat earthers. I, I, I find it amusing and fun, although I don't think someone believing in a flat earth in, in general uh, is a danger to society. So there's a, there's a different line there. Um, I had a conversation in the last six months with a teacher from New Zealand who refused to get vaccinated. So she lost her job. Now, many people said to me, why was I platforming her? But within the conversation, it became very evident that she actually didn't have any information. And we were able to extrapolate out um, that she was misinformed. Mm -hmm. So there was pushback and that did happen. But what do we need to do as communicators? What does the media need to do, mass media, um, to provide a space for some of these minor contrary opinions, but also not perhaps, you know, put out the, uh, whatever his name was, Dr. Malone thoughts that it could be a danger to society. Yeah. So that's where things get very tricky. And, uh, and we confront this a tremendous amount because I, you know, I am 100% pro free speech, pro 
the you know free exchange of ideas and you know f freedom of religion, freedom of belief, all of that, absolutely. Um, but you know, free speech and freedom of ideas and everything doesn't mean that you're free to spread whatever you think on whatever forum you think you should have access to. Yeah. And it also doesn't mean that um, somebody who does have a big platform owes you that, owes to give you th that platform, or that somebody with a big platform has no responsibility when they make decisions about who to give it to because everybody deserves free speech. Um, so where do we make room for the minority opinion, which may turn out to be correct or criticism of a mainstream idea? Or even if it is wrong, where do we still make the room for it to have that conversation? Yeah. So what would be the, yeah, I guess one way to frame this is what would be the ideal society that we would all want to live in, you know? And, in, in, but of course you have to decide what matters to you the most. Some people say the, their ideal society is 100% unfiltered freedom of speech um, and just let let it all sort itself out. And uh, I don't know that most people really would agree with that or want that when you think about it. You think, okay, so regardless of the consequences, you know, so, so therefore, and you know, people, fraud is okay. It's let the buyer beware. And, you know, there's no way for, you know, unless you educate yourself on everything, every single aspect of this increasingly complex world, you are just thrown to the wolves when it comes to, Whatever you know, you just getting healthcare or getting someone to repair your car or purchasing you know products or whatever. It's just all information is out there and there's no filter and everyone's just it's just a free for all, the wild west, think, as we say. Don't you think those people are disingenuous though? Because people who say that yes. to me, I, I say to them, so if I started a campaign accusing you of being a pedophile. Uh, you know, free speech, all information is out there. I can say what I want. I can do what I want. Yeah. Obviously we have laws at the moment about libel where you can't do that. But, but for these people who claim to be purists, if you give them a scenario that doesn't suit with them or that they like very quickly, they still say, well, you can't say that. Yeah. Well, absolutely. There are exceptions and there are the, there are, even in the, in the U S where we have an amendment protecting free speech, there are exceptions for like libel and slander for port for uh, pedophilia, child pornography, for, for demonstrable fraud, like you can't defraud people and for criminal activity, right? You, free speech does not uh, protect you from criminal activity. Um, so, right, if you engage in speech that is part of a conspiracy, you can't say, well, it's free speech, therefore I'm not guilty of a conspiracy. It doesn't work that way. So yeah, there are absolute exceptions, um, but we err on the side of free speech. And I think that's fine to err on the side of, of free speech. Um, but we have to look at different uh, arenas, right? Uh, and again, in the public square, I don't care what anyone says. You want to start a web page and spout absolute nonsense. You are absolutely free to do that. As long as you don't violate the strictly illegal types of speech, like libel and fraud, mm -hmm. right? But if you want to spout pseudoscientific, totally total nonsense. You have the absolute right to do that. So people often confuse what we're talking about with that sort of free speech. Like you want to ban people from saying things or jail people for, you know, be the thought police or whatever. No, it's never, ever, ever about that. That the purists try to make it about that because that's where they want to have their argument. But it's never about that. It's about, you know, positive decisions to give specific platforms to amplify certain voices, right? How are those decisions made? So in the context of academia, there is, a, you know, a, thousands of years of, of history about scholarship, right? There is a certain, you have to prove that what you're doing meets certain standards of scholarship appropriate to the field. And, you know, when you past those bars, that gives you access to certain things like the peer-reviewed literature or lecturing at a university or whatever. Um, but we don't give those same access to those platforms to anybody who's saying anything, because then that would mean what we're really doing is abolishing any standard of scholarship. And academia would crumble if that happened. It would not exist. Um, there's another, there's also then professional um, arenas where it's like, you know, if uh, and this is, varies by country to country, state to state. But like, for example, in most places make it illegal to practice medicine without a license, right? So we say, okay, fine. You can present yourself as a medical expert 
treat people, do whatever, but you have to pass certain standards. You have to have graduated from medical school, passed your board exams, you know, met certain criteria and you get licensed. And then that license gives you the ability to do certain things, but then also holds you to certain standards, ethical standards and quality standards. That's the societal contract. Journalists have their standards. They have journalistic standards where you have to double source things. You have to fact do fact checking. You have an editorial filter. And right. And so uh, when so when we're saying, well, that doesn't meet a reasonable journalistic standard, saying that that violates someone's free speech is completely missing the point. It has nothing to do about free speech. It has to do about quality control within the a specific arena. Um, and, um, and most of the time, we're just talking about self-imposed quality control. Mm. I never said rogan should be banned or banished or whatever or censored I, I i didn't even say that anything should be done you know i'm willing to say that i think rogan should improve the quality of his own show that he should and I, I also think uh that spotify has a right to have an editorial filter on who they give their platform to you know a private company has a right to say what they're going to and not going to promote Rogan has the right to say what he's going to have on a show. We're not going to have on a show. And I have the right to criticize him if I think he's making terrible editorial decisions. So I think that's where all of that happens. There's an, there are journalistic standards. There are academic standards. There are professional standards. There are scientific standards. And we have to have the ability to enforce those standards, not by taking away someone's right to go in the middle of the street and say whatever they want or start a web page or whatever, or a newsletter, you know, whatever media is available to you, but, but saying that you don't have an unlimited right to whatever platform you think you want to have to spread your word far and wide. Now, what that creates, you know, ideally again, in an ideal situation is that you have this kind of filter effect, right? Where mm -hmm. you have sort of low standard open-ended forums where anything goes, and then maybe I, good ideas that meet some kind of standard might filter up to a higher level, and then a higher level still until you get to the pinnacle, which you know again depends on on what the what the context is. But like with, within science, you might have this tiered effect where it's like, okay, your ideas you can publish a preliminary re study in a throwaway journal, right? Some, you know, a, a journal that is dedicated to your narrow field and will publish almost anything in that field, you know? And then, but if, if that idea, you know, gets more and more acceptance and gets vetted and there's more and more evidence to support it, that idea then filters up to more and more prestigious journals and then maybe gets discussed at conferences. And then, you know, again, it just filters up. And then, and then at some point it goes into a textbook and then it's taught to students. And that's kind of the end, the end game where we go, all right, this is now established. But that doesn't mean that it's censorship or violating anyone's freedom of speech if we don't take a crank idea that's at the bottom rung and put it in a textbook and bypass the entire yeah. process of filtering up through quality control. Now, in the brick and mortar media world that we used to have before the internet, there was also this process. You know, you start at a local news outlet or whatever, you write for some local newsletter as your your experience, the quality of what you write, your training or your mentorship, whatever, the, the actual stuff that you produce gets recognized as having higher and higher quality. You get promoted to bigger and bigger platforms until you're writing for the New York Times or you're anchoring ABC News. And those people are incredibly vetted. So the system is kind of designed to allow the cream to float to the top, but there's plenty of room at the bottom for open discussion. And, and I think that is kind of right. works best. But now social media has just mixed everything together, right? Yeah, yeah. So now there's no pyramid. There's no filter. Someone like Joe Rogan could have more people listening to him than anyone else, you know, have the most popular podcast, be getting more listeners than mainstream outlets um, because he's entertaining and he's funny and he talks to interesting people. And, and so the algorithm has shifted. There's no longer a cream rise to the top. You earn your bones. You show that you know what you're doing, that you follow the ethics, that you're not going to lie, you know, that you do your research or you, whatever. You do what you need to do. You have a journalistic standard in there um, in order to filter up to the top. And, 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 and the people who are on the big outlets 
are the are hopefully the cream of the crop, right? They're the best of the best. That's what we would like to see. Um, but instead, eh, anyone could have a massive audience. And and I think you know, that's part of what I was writing about. Like Joe Rogan is a microcosm. He is a symptom of this change where now someone like Joe Rogan, we have to, we have to be talking about Joe Rogan's editorial policy. How did yeah. he get there? How, how did he get there? You know, he didn't. He didn't get vetted. There was no process. It was just he. He was able to garner a large audience, not based on quality, based on entertainment, based on it's interesting. And what's happening is is now it's kind of flipping the other way. You were talking about the brick and mortar, like if yeah. you think about yeah. newspapers, because now the CNNs of the world or the MSNBCs of the world or the whatever the outlet is are looking to Joe Rogan and going, "Holy crap, he's got eleven million. Uh, I mean, he does three podcasts a week. I, I guess that means there's 33 million interactions with listeners a week. If he's got 11 million people a podcast, we've got a million for our prime time show. We need to be more like Joe. Yeah. And yeah. so then it's flipping the other way, and the and the algorithm is now coming back from that sensationalism and from that no editorial expectation back to CNN. Um, it made me think as well as you were talking about the dangers of social media. I've always believed for a long time that one of the biggest problems with social media is it's given society and people, individuals within society, the the false expectation that their opinion matters. Because mm -hmm. now that they can put their opinion out there to the world, with, you know, with uh, with this, then they think, therefore, my my opinion matters. And then some of those people who, I guess, are sensational, who who are uh, maybe well, maybe insightful, maybe they're genuine, and maybe there's good reason as well, as you say, rise to the top. Um, so well, what about the danger of CNN, MSNBC, whatever, X news agency now looking to Joe Rogan and go, we could monetize that? Because as you were talking about the cream going to the top, I was thinking some of the comments I've heard about some of the highest profile broadcasters in America um, and they're lacking in perhaps that quality is more a sign of it's a month, it's a business. And the idea mm -hmm. of a business is to make money. So therefore, uh, you know, like New Zealand has uh, Radio New Zealand and TVNZ, which are, I guess in America, it's PBS. Or, PBS, or, yeah. And, and in the UK, well. it's BBC. The essential nature of these groups that kind of just do the news, and it doesn't even matter so much about the ratings, but all the other ones, they need the ratings to pay. I heard about Chris Cuomo is getting a $9 million payout. That's got to come from somewhere. And if they can get more money because they can be more like Joe, they can go back the other way and do that. Yeah. So there's, that's why there's multiple layers here. And I do get into this in the article. Like one of those algorithms is whatever makes the most money, right? If that's mm. what you're following, then, and, and journalistic quality is below that. It's just eyeballs. All I care about is eyeballs. Clickbait. That's what, that's when you, that's again, that, that's what, that's the underlying algorithm that leads to the sensationalism algorithm if it bleeds it leads that yeah. leads to the oh let's cater to a demographic and then that's the fox news approach like let's just pick a demographic and you know i think ales had you know didn't pick it at random but uh you know you let's say i'm we're going to curate the news to tell people what they want to hear not we're not going to give them information. We're not going to give them a balanced view of what's happening out there in the world. We're going to tell them what they want to hear. And then that is actually a very pernicious algorithm because there's a feedback loop because it radicalizes the audience who then demands more and more extreme and radical news to feed their increasing radical radicalization and extreme views. The other algorithm that goes, that is rides right along with that is we need to anger our audience because angry viewers will watch more. They'll be more engaged. Um, so we want to engage our audience. We want to tell them what we want to hear and we want to make them really angry. And we do that by demonizing the other side um, and then and creating a narrative designed to anger them and to, and and to keep them emotionally at a fever pitch, so that's the Fox News algorithm. That is, I think, extremely dangerous. I think it's more dangerous than Joe Rogan, to be honest with you. I mean, that's the kind of thing that absolutely destroys democracy and polarizes society. Um, and then there's the 
another sort of parallel algorithm that's riding along with all of these other trends. And that is, and you kind of alluded to this, but let me say it explicitly, it's the truth oh. doesn't matter. There is no truth. There are no facts. There are only opinions. You have your truth. I have my alternative truth. You, you know, there's truthiness, right? There's no facts or truth. It's all opinion. And therefore, there is no stratification. There is no scholarship or academia or journalistic vetting or whatever. It's all just stuff that people say. And my stuff is as good as your stuff is as good as his stuff. You have no right to say what anyone else, you know, you know, presents, you know, talks about or, or whatever. And so it's just all just this mishmash of nonsense. Once we lose a shared common reality, you lose the ability to, to have a process by which we decide that's more likely to be true and that's more likely to be not true, then, you know, again, democracies can't function, science can't function, media can't function. So that's kind of where we're heading now. Um, and we're, and, and like science communicators, critical thinkers, thinkers, skeptics are trying to figure out how do we reverse this trend? Yeah. You know, the, the default is always education. You know, we need to make people media savvy. We need to educate people so they can be their own filter. They can figure it out by themselves. And of course, the free speech people like, yes, that's what you should do. That just, just do that. Don't do anything else. Just teach people to work it out for themselves. It's like, well, yeah, we, we should do that. We need to do that. But we can't only do that, you know, because that's not enough. And you need, there needs to be infrastructure and institutions that dis to, can determine truth from fiction, can promote the truth and, you know, downvote, you know, the fiction, can debunk the fiction even. Um, and, and this is, you see, this is a really delicate balance, you know, like, for, like for example, you know, skeptics learned a long time ago that we shouldn't debunk a fringe belief that doesn't have any kind of following uh, because we're going to breathe, give it life. We're going to breathe life into something that's now wallowing in anonymity on the fringe that you, you never want to give somebody more exposure than they already have in the process of debunking them because it backfires. Right. Um, that's why I don't have to worry about Joe Rogan. There's nothing I could do to have any significant impact on his reach or his <laughs> audience. So I don't have to worry about that, but you know, like when flat earth, flat earth, there's for a long time, like we didn't really spend a lot of time. They existed forever. You know, we didn't spend a lot of time talking about them because they were so on the fringe. It wasn't worth it. Um, but once they became more mainstream, it's like, okay, now we got to take on, you know, now, yeah. you know, Kari, thought, we, we have to, we have, now. yeah, we have to explain to yeah. people how we know the earth isn't flat, you know, <laughs> and, and, but it also, because not just that the other, it's always about that. You know, it's like, yeah, the, you know, as if we have to point this out, but it, here's, there's always these deeper layers of science, even to the simplest of questions. Like, how do we know what the shape of the earth is? That's actually an interesting scientific question when you get down to it. And, you know, there's lots of subtle ways we can prove the earth is a sphere, roughly a sphere. Um, and, and so you could teach a lot of science in that process. But the other, the other side of the coin is how do people come to the belief that the earth is flat? That's a, that's a psychological and neurological question that fascinates me. And if I can understand how somebody can come to believing the earth is flat, maybe I'll understand how to keep people from believing that the world is flat. Cause that's the ultimate goal is to keep yeah. people from falling down these rabbit holes. You know, there, obviously there was, you, you can't just walk up to somebody like, you know what? The earth is flat. And those scientists are all lying and no one's going to believe you. They're going to think you're, you're crazy. So what there had to have been a process. What's the rabbit hole? What is that yeah. process? And or, or maybe there was some some groundwork was laid by some other process. You know, like first you make people into conspiracy theorists, and then you can get them to believe any conspiracy, right? Um, for example. So anyway, understanding and unpacking all of that is really important. You know, obviously we're facing all of these questions today. How do we confront pseudoscience? How do we balance? you know, journalistic standards with free speech and academic standards with academic freedom, et cetera. And how do we have a, how do we allow minority scientific opinions to flourish while still not confusing the public with minority scientific opinions that haven't proven themselves yet? We don't want to elevate them to equal footing to absolutely rock solid proven science, yeah. right? 
So um, it, we need to confront all of these things because the institutions that we had 30, 40 years ago that were not, they weren't perfect. They must say that they were perfect, but they were at least trying to do all these things. They're not cutting it anymore. They're being, we're in the middle of a sea change and we have to figure out going forward, how are we going to do this? Now, this is a huge question. I don't have all the answers to it. When I, you know, when I wrote about Joe Rogan, I didn't say, here's the answer. All I said was, this is the world that we have created today. How do you like it? How you like in this world that we made with these institutions like social media? Is this, is this what you want, everything you want it to be? Or you think maybe we could do better? I, I think that um, there's, I think there's a, a potential irony here. I'm just going to bring your article back up again so people can see it as we're talking. Uh, because I wonder if the algorithm that you're talking about and, and you mentioned sensationalism and kind of what we are, our, almost our habits, is actually going to be the answer for Joe Rogan. I'll get to that in a second because I, I thought about the, the, the downvote you were talking about. Can we downvote? The problem with the downvote in today's society is, as you've already identified, is when you get fed the same information and you become part of an ecosystem of belief and you become tribal, then there's no one left to downvote bad mm. ideas. They only upvote the good ideas. So the idea of it, like the Reddit downvote and yay, all those terrible ideas will get to the bottom. If you're in a tribe of Fox News viewers who thinks there was a pedophile ring underneath a pizza house that didn't have a basement. I mean, that was debunking mm. that immediately. That pizza house didn't have a basement to have the, the ring in. Um, then there's no one left to downvote and it made me think as well my very first question to you was about what kind of algorithm are we talking about is it the facebook algorithm in the background working based on ai or is it what we do our, our habits i didn't use that word then but habitual algorithms and what we choose to want to see you're talking about fox news uh john stewart did the best work ever on fox news before he left the daily show where he demonstrated very clearly that the morning show would um would report something as opinion and then the news show would say some locations are reporting, realizing it was actually their own morning show that was reporting that. And it was a way they were able to turn an opinion into news. Um, and so they have that, uh, as you say, the angry you get, the more you watch. I think the research is pretty clear online that people tend to interact more with opinions they don't agree with. So Facebook and those other social media sites, but I think particularly Facebook seems to now have taken up that algorithm and their AI and they feed us stuff that we're going to conflict with because that's what keeps us on Facebook longer. So I don't know, I don't know which is the chicken and which is the egg in that conversation, but it seems that they're both, one of them is doing them through AI and one of them is doing through, I guess, editorial choice being Fox news, but kind of achieving, achieving the same thing of keeping people around and keeping them on for longer. Yeah, exactly. And and there's yeah, with with social media, there are literal computer algorithms that have automated the decision making process about what to elevate, what to promote, what to show you. So like YouTube infamously is driven by algorithms where if you search for uh, lunar eclipse, you will be fed videos about flat earther. So they they deliberately have an algorithm that serves you more and more radical views and because that will engage you more. And so th there's essentially an automated computer algorithm within social media social media platforms that are designed to radicalize people. Be you know because that's what keeps eyes, you know, on the tube, right? That so uh and it, it can't be more explicit than that. It essentially is made mathematical and explicit more behind the door editorial policies. You know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah. so like, we could say we can infer what Fox news is doing by what they show, but unless you're in the meeting in the, yeah. you know, in the room, you don't know what that, what they're saying about their editorial policy. You know, there are some ex reporters who will tell you what that policy is, you know, so you can get some insight that way, but otherwise we have to infer it by the end result. But with like, with these social media algorithms, there's a literal mathematical algorithm that you could point to, to say, this is what they're doing. I, and, and, and this is the so result. You, you, you can see it. I mean, I know I, I watch a lot of YouTube. I, I I take on board content a lot and you can see it. I get fed different stories in the morning on YouTube because that's when I always go and say what's happened in world news overnight. So in the morning, my YouTube feed is all full of CNN and Fox News and MSNBC and the Young Turks and David Pakman and Stephen Crowder and all these people who who put out news. Uh, and some of them news. Um, but in the evening, it's all it's all different kind of the stuff that 
I might more watch rather than a television show. And actually, yeah. their algorithms are smart enough not just to know what I like, but to know what I like, what I watch, and when I watch it. And it feeds that to me as well. Now, there's another layer here, which is even worse. As bad as everything we've spoken about is. So we're talking about just how do we get more people to watch for longer and how that incentive leads to sensationalism and catering to a an echo chamber it's, and radicalization, et cetera. Uh, but, but also the the whole process is deliberately manipulated by people with an uh, with other agendas not just making money by get, or by getting people to watch their stuff but they might have an ideological or a political or a commercial agenda this has also been around with us forever but you know we for example like product placement in a movie you know is kind of a of a of a more benign manifestation of that where you have artistic decisions being made to sell product. But then you might also then talk about sponsored posts. Like what if you did a segment of your show where you interview somebody who, and the sole purpose of this was to sell a new product and you were paid to do it. You know, this wasn't a journalistic or editorial decision on your part. You were say paid to sell a product and you didn't fully disclose that you did that or you had a little disclaimer sponsored content that you know most people won't see or many people might not even understand what that means yeah and then there's also um ideologues who will or, or like political you know um activists who will do things like so for example you could say some some horrible nonsense about a candidate let's say could say that they're a pedophile, they eat babies, whatever. You make up some whatever horrible thing. They're, they've sold state secrets to the enemy. Make up, just make up horrible stuff. You put that out there or you, you republish a doctored video, making them seem like they're saying things they never said, etc. And then it has its one to two days of going viral. And then it gets debunked. And you're like, oh, my bad. You take it down. It's too, the damage is done though. Yeah. The Lies damage is done. The and they know this. They know that. It's like this is not an, a whoopsie. This is a deliberate exploitation of how the system works in order to make, you know, you know, incorrect uh, statements, to spread lies, to spread politically motivated, damaging lies, uh, and 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 then skate off scot-free because by the time the news cycle catches up with it. You go on to the next thing. This was done, you know, the last couple of election cycles, you know, in, in the U.S., you know, quite frequently. Facebook, you know, was became notorious for this, you know, spreading doctored photos. And then, you know, people don't ever they the thing is, when people think back on the episode, even if they were told this was a fake photo three months later, they think back on that episode. They just remember the fake claim. Right. They don't yeah, remember yeah. that it was debunked. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so so. Uh, it's like following the letter of the law in order to subvert the the intention of the law or the standards or whatever. And so the yeah, so the these media outlets are being you know, social media outlets are being exploited for this. But then you have to ask the question: Do they care? Because they're letting it happen. It drives controversy. It drives views. It drives clicks. So they could say we're you know taking steps to you know, get this stuff off of our, of our platform, but yeah, after it drove all the traffic though, totally. you know, and, so. And, go ahead. And, and your algorithm question, like I wanted to jump, jump in here because I realized we're going to wrap up shortly. Um, and I, and I said before that I wonder if the algorithm itself is the solution to the Joe Rogan issue. Um, so the algorithm promoted the Joe Rogan situation but now you're seeing people um, put forward, I don't really need that word just here, do I? Put forward uh, some of the things they don't like about Joe Rogan and the algorithm algorithm is now picking up on that. Now, I, I personally think that some of the stuff they're putting out there is a bit unfair because there's been a switch in society as to various words and 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 how they're getting to be used and how they, they can and can't be used. But that same sensationalist algorithm that maybe promoted the pseudoscience seems to now be promoting things like this. And I'm I'm sure people know about this, but this is a Joe Rogan cut and I won't play 
a lot of it, but where he's saying nigger. pretty there horrific, offensive things. Like and that's like what um nigger. and that's, that's what nigger. is now being promoted in that same algorithm. And that might be the thing that causes Joe Rogan to eventually go, I need to change, or Spotify to go, if you don't change, you're done. And because we have you in a contract, we'll keep paying you. And and you're basically you know, like like kicking yeah, off yeah. Trump yeah. off Twitter. Um so so I'm interested to get your thoughts on that, but I want to ask you one other thing as well. This is a clip off The Daily Show, and as you just heard, horrifically, they put out the audio when Joe Rogan was using the N-word numerous times. Um, I, I could get into a conversation about the context, but I'm more interested in this part as well. I think we would all agree that within media and broadcasting, in fact, I've been told this by bosses of mine in the past, I used to work in talk radio, that the N-word and the C-word are the two worst words in the world. You know, they don't use them. They're the ones that in broadcasting you shouldn't use. However, it seems in America that the N-word as it was gets used in broadcast, but during Joe Rogan's apology, and it's all smushed together, and it looks f***ing horrible. Even they bleep the F-word. And I was also interested in what it means in the media when the television will show a, a trail of 20 N-words, which we're now understanding and people are now accepting if they didn't accept before is you know the one of the worst words in the world and they'll broadcast that but then they'll bleep the f word apparently fuck is uh, more offensive to listen on television than the n word but the n word is more offensive to say in public and will cause you more trouble i thought that was an interesting sort of observation but but the point being the algorithm that joe rogan is now suffering at is the same algorithm I guess from this conversation that he has benefited from, is that the solution to, if I can say, the Joe Rogan issue? So, I mean, if I, if I can boil all that down, I think what you're saying is that at times there is there is blowback, and uh, people can, uh, you know, suffer at at the hands of the mob as well. That the public can be fickle. Not a really a good fix. Sure, it, it, I think it's just, again that's like the mob mentality, where it, I think it's probably more likely to blow back against people who don't deserve it than do. It certainly right. wouldn't be the mechanism I would choose as a quality control filter. You know, at the back end is like if you if you do something which incenses the mob, then maybe something will be done about it. We also know that the, the, historically that doesn't work very well. It, at best, these are very short-lived counter reactions and then people go on doing what they were doing. Um, I would note though that Spotify deleted a hundred episodes of the Joe mm -hmm. Rogan experience where he used the N-word. Um, and of course, you know, the, the, uh, the recent controversy is about deleting two episodes where he spread dangerous health misinformation. Uh, but they, no one's talking about the fact that a hundred episodes have already been taken off the platform, you know, before using the N word. Um, I, I, you know, I just want to make it clear about I would push back and at least in the U S you know, in the media environment that I'm familiar with, it has been decades since it's been okay for a white person, a white guy to say the N word on mainstream, you know, TV or media. And, Rogan knows this. He, you know, you, there's no world in which it was okay for him to use that language. And I've never heard it said on mainstream media. Um, you know, movies and things where you're playing a character, historical, whatever. Okay, yes, but someone to for someone being themselves to say it, never. It's always the N word. Let, let me um, just let me just let me just expand on that, just to make sure people don't think I think it was okay to say it. Oh, I what I'm saying you're saying that. Yeah, what, what I'm saying is I think that there was a there was a time when reporting about the use of the N word could involve reporting the actual N word. Mm -hmm. um, I'll well, give you an example. When I went in, in 2010, 2011, when I was working in Talkback, we were talking about the Dam Busters movie. Peter Jackson here in New Zealand was looking to remake the Dam Busters. In the Dam Busters, the original, there is a character called N Word the dog and the debate mm. in New Zealand media was, are they going to remake the Dan Busters and is the dog going to be called N word? Now on that night, the N word was used on our biggest radio station numerous times talking about that. Um, but that to that in that era, well, I'm not going to say might've been okay, but certainly didn't have the same weight to not being okay mm. as it does today. Now I'm not defending Joe. And I'm not saying when he used it, it was appropriate. We all, we don't know yet about the, the comments about Planet of the Apes. Go and look it up and find it out for yourself. But there has been a shift in 
talking about the n-word and not using the n-word let's say in the last decade 20 years maybe maybe different in america because obviously america has a different cultural yeah. context yeah. to that word than the rest of the world um but it is still interesting to me that on comedy central and on television the n-word was still if it's not ever used and it's not okay able to be broadcast when the f-word isn't as well i'm just wondering what that says about uh well i guess the editorial which comes back to that question you've been talking about the editorial decisions yeah i just i just don't know that that's uh, you know necessarily a solid point at least not in the us you know i think most of the time those things go together most outlets would bleep both i think it's right. probably your your maybe just quirky exposure to an exception to the rule it's not the rule yeah, okay, okay, it's, certainly, okay. it's certainly not the rule at least not in the united states at least not for a very long time um so yeah that's that, that that's you know my experience my understanding um again i can't i can't even remember when the word was used uh you know um in any kind of mainstream media um even talking about it you can't say it you know what i mean by a white, and I have to say, by a white person, because it's okay if you're black, because again, this is, there's a huge cultural story behind this, and that's perfectly reasonable. It's just, yeah. it's the word was is has such a history of oppression and is so derogatory and negative and hateful, et cetera. There's just no situation where it's appropriate for a white person to use that word. So therefore, if in America, if that is the case, and, and completely yeah. accept that and, and agree, and 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 if my statement before was ignorant and wrong, I accept that. Um, that is this algorithm. Mm -hmm. uh, even if it is mob mentality in this instance going to be one of the things that fixes the quote unquote Joe Rogan issue. I don't think so. And again, just historically it doesn't, you know, because it, if, let's say Spotify comes under so much pressure that they end their contract with him. Rogan's not going away. He, he'll it, he, to just shift to something else. And, you know, he doesn't need Spotify to have a big audience and, and to, for, to get that out there. Uh, maybe he makes more money doing it. You know, he wouldn't make, make as much money, but it's not going to solve the problem. And I don't think the way, I don't think that's the way that we should be going about doing it. We wait until there's enough of an outrage and a backlash that somebody has got to do something. That's not the way to handle this. Mm. Uh, again, I think we, we need to figure out some way to, to reestablish some kind of institutional standards Again, not censorship, but standards and, you know, journalistic standards, media standards, professionalism, scientific standards, et cetera, uh, while still allowing for, for, you know, freedom of expression, the exchange of ideas, allowing new and fringe ideas to flourish, you know, but, but it doesn't mean you go right into the textbook. It doesn't mean you go right to the evening news. It doesn't mean that any idea is worthy of massive exposure. No one deserves massive exposure. You have to earn that in some yeah. way. Right now, you earn it by being titillating and interesting and <laughs> yeah. extreme. But but that's that and that world, which is the world we're living in now, yeah, everyone could look around and decide for themselves how they think it's going. If we want to make the world better, maybe we should think about other algorithms where the, the people who get access to massive outlets, again, Outside of the context of entertainment, if you're if you're purely entertainment, then that's that's fine. That's the order. The other out. That's the other trend that I talked about is the blending of news and entertainment into infotainment. That's mm. that's also a big source of this. If you treat everything like entertainment and you follow a purely entertainment algorithm, even the news, even scientific discussion, that's a problem. That that that's not optimal. We need to have a separate process when you're talking about the news, journalism, science, scholarship, whatever, and that has to not value money and eyeballs and sensationalism. It has to value quality and accuracy and ethics and standards, right? And and we we've, we've kind of lost that. Not completely. There's still you know bright spots out there. Um, but we've, I think, lost it basically, you know, the broader culture. Um, and it's had massive negative impact. Um, you know, just America is a political mess because of it. I think that's an uncontroversial opinion, and I'm happy to defend it if you think it's not accurate. <laughs> but America is an absolute in a political disaster. And by some People argue we're on, you know, we're on a path to ending our democracy because of it. I mean, whether that will happen or not remains to be seen. Um, so I would argue it's not working. This is not working for us, yes. and uh, you know, we need to to figure out a way forward. 
Well, I mean, money out of politics would be a good start because that would stop a uh, that would stop a commercial necessity to get eyeballs. Um, last, I guess, last question. Last, last question for you, if that's okay. I'm assuming you wrote the media algorithm story, which was primarily about uh, Dr. Malone and the algorithms around it, prior to the release of that N-word video. Am yeah. I am I yeah. right? Yeah. So yeah. I was wondering if you had have written this after the N-word video came out. Or if you were going to write another one, like an addendum or something on top of this, an extension to this post the N-word video coming out by Joe Rogan, is there anything else you'd add? Is there anything else you'd want to say? I think the point that's relevant there, and this gets hashed out in the comments. You know, the comments are the, I mean, very rarely do I actually addend a blog post. I just put it in a comment, you know, yeah. and the, the comments are very, very active on this post. You can see there were the 200 and something comments so far. Yeah, yeah. I would point out uh, that, what I said already that, you know, Spotify deleted a hundred episodes because of this. Where's the outrage there? You know, we're just saying, so is, are you saying, first of all, was that wrong? Should they have left those episodes up? Um, and is, is Spotify being a hypocrite by deleting those episodes, but not deleting episodes that they were asked to delete by professionals because it's dangerous medical pseudoscience. So that, what does that say about, Spotify's priority, and maybe again they're protecting themselves from the backlash, but not protecting their audience from dangerous misinformation. That's what that's where I think that's relevant. Uh, I'll just read this thing you've just brought it up, and maybe we can wrap with this. Speaking of the interview with Dr. Malone, this is directly from your uh, article, which we'll bring back up for people to see. And if people want to read it in its entirety, go to Neurological Blog. Um, it, uh, this is what the uh, some health experts wrote to Spotify with an estimated 11 million listeners per episode. JRE, which is hosted exclusively on Spotify is the world's largest podcast and has tremendous influence. The letter reads Spotify has a responsibility to mitigate the spread of misinformation on its platform through the company uh, though, sorry, though the company presently has no misinformation policy, which then led into a conversation and you write a bit about it, about other platforms as well and what they're doing. You know, how responsible is YouTube for what's on YouTube, how responsible is Twitter for what goes out on Twitter, how responsible is Spotify for what goes out on Spotify? Yeah, again, that's part of the social media trend. Again, the social media, I make the point very clear, they didn't start these algorithms, these trends, these media feedback loops. They just, you know, made them more explicit and made them much more, you know, high, greater in magnitude. But, um, you know, the, the social media uh, uh, companies can't have it both ways, you know, they and they can't you know, be responsible for like a massive amount of communication around the world where people use them as a news source, as a communication for entertainment, for all of it, and say, we have no responsibility for what's on our platform. Yeah. Um, but, you know, they're, they're obviously trying to do that. So they're, and that that's, you know, this is, this happens every time there's a new technology for communication. It's like the, the old mechanisms don't apply to the new technology then we got to find out new mechanisms, you know, and then that's what we're in the process of doing right now. We're not there yet. I don't know where it's going to go. Um, maybe we'll self-destruct before we can put something in place. Uh, but, or maybe it's just, this is the point in our history where we abandon all pretense to knowing stuff to truth or facts or whatever. Um, uh, but uh, I, I don't think that's going to happen. I think, you know, whatever, there'll, there'll be islands of sanity within the, in the, in the mess somehow. Well, I just hope we can find those islands because predominantly what's happening is we don't find the islands. We find the the, the fringe atolls around the outside of the islands. Yeah. That's, what, that's, what, that's what gets the, the oil, that old squeaky wheel. So, um, look, this has been a fascinating talk. Thank you so much for giving us some time today, uh, Dr. Novella. It's, it's, if people want to find out more about you and read more of your stuff, is, is Neurologica the best place to go? That's a good place to go. There's links there to other stuff that I do. You can see my book there. Also, the skepticsguide.org okay. is, a, is a good central hub of, of all the stuff that I do. Anything you want to leave us with? I I, I, I kind of, I, I, I smiled before. I don't know if you noticed me. I had a little giggle before when you talked about truthiness and I thought about, um, gosh, how much more effective was Stephen Colbert when he was playing that role on Comedy Central than the pablum you see on late night television now. And it, 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 I just had a little moment where I traveled back for 10 seconds remembering the Colbert report and how effective that was as a communicator of, of truth and truthiness. So 
uh, I enjoy that little memory. <laughs> Satire can be very effective if used yeah. properly. But what's interesting, Colbert said that, you know, c conservatives watched his show and they thought it was hilarious. They didn't think that he was making fun of them. You know, he sort of he walked that line where they wow. thought it was kind of a it was a wink and a nod kind of loving, you know, lampoon of that, but not like, no, he's completely making fun of your nonsense, of your beliefs. Um, but they, but they didn't that didn't generally they didn't get that. So that you know that's interesting. But yeah, satire, if used you know very expertly and judiciously, can can be a very effective comedy can be very effective. I, you know, I sometimes like you know, a comedian will make some kind of pithy, funny statement. I'm like, damn, that would have taken me three blog posts to say that. <laughs> and they just nailed it with one joke, you know, that, so there, there is, that's, uh, there, there is definitely something to that. Um, and we, you know, again, the, as a community, we try to bring it all together. You know, we try to ha use all of the means of, of communicating ideas to people to get them to think more about what they believe. If we could just, that's like the first step. Don't just believe everything you read. Think about it. Mm -hmm. um, you think about it carefully. But unfortunately, when you first, if you just say, if you stop there, then people think, oh yeah, I'll do my own research and I'll figure it all out for myself. It's like, no, that's not what I mean. I mean, there is a, there is, it's, it's hard. It is hard. Yeah. It is a long process to get to the point where you can start to sort out what's, you know, likely to be true and what's likely not to be true because there is sufficient, sophisticated nonsense out there, deliberately calculating subtle and complicated, sophisticated nonsense. And unless you have topic expertise, as well as a massive skill set, you know, of media literacy, scientific literacy, critical thinking, it's hopeless. It really is pretty hopeless. So it's, it's, a, it's a lifelong process. We just want people to be on this lifelong process of being more skeptical. Uh I've heard many times it's said once to John. I think I wonder if right now we're missing John Stewart and Stephen Colbert in that instance. That maybe there's no one taken up that mantle yet from what there was 15 years ago. But I've heard it said on his show to him by Al Gore when John Stewart was sitting there going, "Why do we say these things and the news media doesn't?" And Al Gore said very clearly to him, "It was the jester that could speak truth to the king without fear of getting their heads cut off." Mm -hmm. So yes, I I agree with you of the of the comedy, and I think about Dave Chappelle. A lot of criticism of David Chappelle in some areas, but when he talks about race, um, he's one of those guys that with comedy can cut through and 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 educate in a way like very few can. It's it's amazing to see that work. Dr. Stephen Novella, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been such a pleasure. Um, thank you for giving us some time. Uh, if you want to find out more uh, about Stephen and his work, Neurologica blog, just Google it. There's the Joe Rogan uh, uh well, we've talked a lot about the the post today, the blog post today. Go and read it for yourself. And uh, Stephen, it's been an absolute pleasure. I thank you so much for giving us some time and uh, I wish you all the best. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure.